Welcome everybody. We have about one minute before we get started. Uh, if you would like to type in the chat box where you are located, please do so. So I get a little bit of an idea of um, who's here and from where. Uh, if you uh, are an agent at the University of Kentucky and are wanting to get continuing education credits, please um, type in the to the panelist or host or whatever. And um, let me make sure I know you're here so that you can get credit. Um, so anybody else who's from elsewhere, please let me know. Oh, chat is disabled. Thank you for letting me know. I will fix that. Um, everyone and attendees can chat with everyone. There we go. It should be fixed now. So if you would like to um, type in the chat box, we have one from Champaign, Illinois. Thank you for letting me know about the problem with the chat. Okay, I have three o'clock. Uh, oh, we have one from Kentucky, which is always nice. Um, the agents, you will have to um, text me at the end so that I know you stayed the whole time. Okay, so we have three o'clock. We will get started. Let me share my... PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Let me know if you are unable to, whoops, unable to see it. Oh, we got somebody from Nigeria. Welcome. Um, Okay, so my name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I am at the University of Kentucky. Um, I am the poultry extension coordinator here. As part of my job, I work with e-extension, which is the uh, electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service. So it is a US-based service. Um, Although anyone from around the world is allowed to participate in our webinars, they are designed for the states. Um, I, as part of that, I coordinate the, the monthly webinars and the website and the Facebook page. Um, and so hopefully you've taken advantage of those. Um, last year, well, December, I guess, I did a webinar on uh, a quick overview of avian anatomy and um, some people said that it was quick and that they would rather have me look at each particular system and go over some of the problems that can occur with those systems. So this is the first one that is a follow-up to that, uh, which is looking at um, the reproductive system um, and uh, sorry, I was reading the chat. Um, reproductive system and some of the disorders that can uh, help from, can uh, result with the particular uh, systems. So um, we, if I can get this to go again. Uh, okay, so this is a typical production curve for a commercial egg type flock. They typically come into production around 18 weeks of age. Uh, they peak shortly thereafter, and then they slowly decline in their um, egg production. It'll eventually get to a point where they're eating more money in feed than they are giving back in eggs. And so you can either get rid of the flock or um, you can, uh, 
molt them and start all over again. Egg weight also increases as the birds get older. And it's important to remember that they are still growing when they first start laying eggs. Uh, so this is some research that we did with um, what we would call heritage type chickens and compare that to commercial, which is the top line, which is the ease of brown. Um, production period is a four week period. So their production is uh, over here is over 28 weeks. Um, so each production is a four. You can see they increased quickly they peaked and they were slowly declining uh, and the declines started earlier with the um, heritage breeds and they did not peak as high as the uh, the commercial breeds uh, the sex links were somewhere in between that um, but you can see the black osterlarp was the worst so while we showed you the um, the top, um, the top, uh, the typical production curve. Sorry, I keep reading the chat and that distracts me. Um, so, although the typical curve that I showed you before, whoops, is you know what you typically see in a commercial operation. If you have a small backyard flock, if you're using heritage type breeds. Um, then you may not get that level of production. So, you know, don't ex always expect that you're going to see maximum production uh, with your flock. It varies on a lot of things. Also, as I said earlier, remember that at placement in the layer house, the pullet has a range of nutritional needs. They're still growing. They have to maintain what they have already and they need all those nutrients for beginning egg production. So um, the rearing of the birds and their nutrition at the beginning of the uh, production cycle will have major effects on uh, the health of the birds uh, during the um, production cycle. So we got a question. Where the heritage type were the heritage breeds from stores, production flocks, or show stocks? They are a random um, bred flocks we maintain here at the University of Kentucky. Um, we don't bring in any outside birds after that because you know we originally got them from a hatchery, but um, we did not want uh, biosecurity breakage. So they are the university's uh, thing we do not select. It's random uh, maintenance. We use them for our incubation projects. Q and A, what am I? Oh, I did answer that. Okay. <clears throat> so the key to getting potential production is nutrition. You need to provide a complete feed, whether that is mixed yourself or uh, purchased. Um, but whatever, you know, once you've formulated your complete feed, do not dilute the nutrients in that complete feed with scratch grains or cracked corn because it will result in nutritional deficiencies. Most of the problems that I see are from uh, backyard flock owners uh, taking a complete nicely formulated feed and diluting it with the cheaper scratch grains or cracked corn and they end up with nutritional deficiencies and then health problems in their flocks. So if you think of poultry as requiring the same types of nutrients as we do, they are omnivores. Um, so, you know, they need uh, energy, which they get from their cereals. They need, which is typically corn, wheat, or barley, depending on where you are located in the world. In the United States, it's corn. Canada might be wheat or barley. Europe might be wheat or barley. Africa, 
Asia could be whatever is um, grown there or imported depending on your production. Uh, protein is mainly to supply amino acids and that comes from soybeans, whether they're uh, soybean meal or roasted from field peas, canola meal, sunflower seed meal, insects, whatever um, you have available in your area. In the United States, it's mostly soybean meal to go with the corn. So we are corn soybean meal based diets. Uh, and then the vitamins and ve vegetables are, you know, we usually think of as sources of vitamins and trace minerals. And in commercial operations, we provide that as a premix that comes with the all the requirements for all the vitamins and trace minerals that we're going to need. They'll also add um, calcium and phosphorus for uh, egg production and uh, bone. Um, so you get limestone, dicalcium phosphate. So you can see that they are very well aware of the nutrient requirements of all the different stages of production for layers. They know it for ducks. They know it for turkeys. You know, they know they. We know more about the nutrition of chickens than we know about the nutrition of people. They. That's where nutrition research really started was with poultry. And most of the diets are based on a energy content of the diet, which we usually uh, measure as metabolizable energy, which is kilocalories per kilogram. Uh, and so all the other nutrients are balanced based on that energy content. The chickens will eat to meet their energy requirement, so they know how much the chickens will eat uh, based on the energy content of the diet, and they formulate all the other nutrients in relation to that. So the energy level of the diet is what they use as the starting base, though unfortunately they never put it on a feed tag. So if you think of, again, as the parts of the diet, you got a nice, um, you know, well, formulated feed and then you add scratch grains or cracked corn, either of those are energy. So you have suddenly overpowered all the other nutrients with energy. So they are going to eat less of the complete feed and they're going to end up with nutritional deficiencies, whether that's the vitamin and trace minerals, the, um, the macro minerals, the protein, all of that is going to be affected by diluting the complete feed with energy. And that will come into play when we start looking at some of the reproductive problems in um, laying birds. Uh, so the uh, main problems that we see with uh, reproductive problems are uh, what we've been calling egg peritonitis, uh, being egg bound, uh, having a prolapse and oviduct impaction. There are a few uh, other ones that can come up, but these are the ones that we see most commonly. So we'll start there. Uh, one of the main problems that we see with improper nutrition, especially with a high energy diet is too much fat. So uh, this bird, which was opened for a um, anatomy lesson, you can see the fat pad. Chicken meat is not marbled like beef. So most of the poultry fat is under the skin or in the fat pad in the abdomen. So you can see here, there is a very large fat pad. It's in the abdominal area and so could have effects on the laying of eggs uh, and other reproductive uh, issues. So having an overweight chicken or duck or turkey with too much uh, abdominal fat can interfere with both the health of the bird and the production. So this is the reproductive tract of um, a chicken, but it's similar for all the different bird species. And it is made up of two separate parts. The 
the o whoops the ovary and the uh, oviduct they are separate parts um, so let's see if this works this is a video that was made decades ago that shows you the um, the ovulation of an egg from the reproduction track of a chicken and I forgot to share sound so um, oops, we stop sharing. And when I share, I need to share. Uh, where's my sound? Okay, share sound. Let's try again. So as I said, this is um, this is a very old video um, done by Kansas State Agricultural College when it existed before Kansas State. And it will show you what ovulation looks like in a live chicken. The pencil point indicates the spot where the rupture will start and later shows the germ spot. So that's what the pencil point indicates. That's what ovulation looks like. Um, and so uh, I'm missing something here. Where did it go? Oh, here we are. So this just shows you how the yolk is then picked up by the oviduct. Uh, you can't really film that. The infundibulum is a muscle that engulfs the uh, the yolk. So let's go back to what I was doing. So what we call yolk peritonitis is basically defined as inflammation of the peritoneum, which is the tissue that lines your abdominal wall, um, typically caused by a bacterial infection. Um, with chickens, the ovulated yolk is not picked up by the infundibulum. It ends up in the body cavity. If it happens too often, the yolk becomes infected because yolk is a great material for bacterial growth. Uh, more recently, we do not call it egg peritonitis because they have found uh, new things about the problem. Uh, there's a the ovary and the infundibulum that is separated from it. Okay, I didn't want that again. Okay, so we now call it egg-related colomitis. They always wanna make it more complicated to say. It's because birds do not have a peritoneum, they have a coleum. Uh, they do not have a body cavity per se, they have a selimic cavity. Um, and because the offending substance, which uh, we are referring to the yolk in the yolk peritonitis, it can be more than just the yolk that causes the problem. It can also be other parts of the egg. Um, mild cases may be de detected at necropsy so that you didn't even know they were sick. They died of something else or or maybe the, the infected um, material. But generally, uh, chickens can tolerate mild coelomitis uh, much better than some of the pet birds like parrots. So um, as I said, the main thing that we think of uh, as causing the problem is what they call an ectopic ovulation. So the follicle ruptures and the yolk does not enter normally into the cavity, this can, into the oviduct. This can be a result of the infundibulum missing it or the um, hen, uh, whatever type of hen, duck, turkey, geese, chicken is uh, roughly handled and um, a yolk is released 
prematurely from an ovary and gets into the body cavity. So the causes can be the missed yolk by the infundibulum, the ectopic ovulation, or it can be because of the rough handling. But uh, the reason for the name change is because they have shown that a shelled egg or a shellless egg from the oviduct can move back up the oviduct and be released through the infundibulum into the salomic cavity. This can be the result of a bacterial infection, an oviductal impact, or abnormal conformation of the oviduct. The oviduct can get twisted and block it. Um, and then instead of you know, trying to pass through the vent, it goes back up and is released into the body cavity. It can also happen because heavy hands, uh, again, I told you that having all that fat in that area can interfere with the flow of the developing egg. And, and any hens that have inadequate calcium can also cause the problem. Calcium is essential for muscle function. And so uh, if they uh, do not have adequate calcium, the muscles and the oviduct is a muscle. If it does not have adequate calcium, it doesn't function properly. And that can cause that uh, retrograde flow or basically the backing up of the shelled or shellless eggs from the middle of the oviduct. So that's why they changed the name to egg-related rel colovitis so, because they don't have the, peritone the peritoneum. They have a salomic cavity uh, and it can be egg-related, not just yolk. So some of the clinical signs, you get a penguin-like stance because of the abdominal distension. They start eating and drinking less. They lose weight. They may sit excessively in the nest box and you might think they've gone broody. Um, they may be laying deformed or soft-shelled eggs or they may not be laying at all or they you know, may just look depress depressed or uh, lethargic. Okay, so, oh, went too far. Uh, this is um, from a research paper um, and it looks at what they're still calling acute peritonitis with the white exudate attached to the surface of the ova and the intestine. Remember this is in the body cavity uh, or the salomic cavity. Um, and since the, the yolk or ova as they say here, um, and the, the full size of the oviduct indicates that the hen was laying, uh, but the um, yolks weren't getting into necessarily the uh, oviduct. This is what happens when the yolk material becomes infected. Uh, the, the infection is going to end up killing the, the birds. Uh, as I said, they have that um, penguin-like stance and some of the causes, as I said, overweight hens, that some of it is genetic, especially with turkeys. Stress can cause it. If during the rearing of the birds, the immune system was compromised, if there is an infection of, you know, anywhere in the body, if they have intestinal parasites, if they have ovarian tumors, or as I said, if the oviduct is impacted, all of those will cause the egg-related solomitis. Chat. Ma'am, screen is not cleat. I assume you mean clear. Is anybody else having trouble with the, the uh, screen? I'm not sure whether it is... Uh, Anybody else? It may just be your um, your broadband. I'm not sure. There's a gray box in the middle. Okay, in between they are dark. 
Hmm. Okay, I will stop sharing. Keep opening and blocking your screen. Oh, that's probably when I check the chat box. Okay, we'll try sharing the screen again. Please remove this window. Is that better? Are you ready? Chat box? See what happens if I open chat box. Yes, ma'am, better, okay. Okay, hopefully it stays that way and it's not black screens from my checking the chat box to see if you can see it. Okay, so the egg-related coelomitis diagnosis is first and foremost done on a uh, palpation of the abdomen. I got another, I, it's still there, but on top. Okay, uh, how do I get rid of that? I don't know how to get rid of that because that's telling me what to do. <laughs> Sorry, hopefully it doesn't glow, cover up too much. So the first way to, to do it is with the uh, physical exam. So palpation of the uh, al al abdomen and the, you should be able to feel the soft shelled or firm shelled eggs in the oviduct. You should be able to detect any ectopic yolks free within the abdomen. Uh, you should be able to detect any ovarian masses. And uh, if there is anything in the salomic cavity, it's going to displace the gizzard, also known as the ventriculus. Uh, the veterinarians can also do a complete blood cell count, which uh, mainly you want to count, count the white blood cells, which are part of the immune system. A high white blood, blood cell count usually indicates that there is an inflammation or infection inside the body. Uh, they can do a blood culture to try and identify the bacteria that's causing the infection, or um, the anti they can they can also do an antibiotic. Uh, sensitivity test to identify the best antibiotic that can be used to treat uh, the infection. They can also do abdominal fluid cytology. So basically they put in a needle and remove uh, some of the fluid from the salomic cavity and they send it to a diagnostic lab for further testing although that usually takes time and it may not be time that the bird has. You can also do radiography and ultrasound, which may help in revealing the presence of accumulated egg material or other space occupying lesions that may be going on in the salomic cavity or the oviduct, which we'll talk about with the impacted oviduct. So the treatment varies depending on the cause and severity of the clinical signs. As I said before, mild cases with no secondary bacterial infection may only require some supportive care, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, so this uh, bird here, uh, which you can't read at the top because of the black thing is a two-year-old speckled Sussex hen presented to the veterinarian for lameness, but on physical examination was found to have distended doughy salomic cavity suggested of egg-related peritonitis. Interesting that they say salomic cavity, but then still use peritonitis. Uh, the hens had also stopped laying. Uh, they treated them, and this is the supportive care with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and meloxicam orally. Um, and within 
a short period of time, she was able to walk and eventually start laying eggs. So the first compound is um, a sulfa type antibiotic that was used to treat the infection. And the meloxicam is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, which is used off-label uh, in pet poultry. It's not approved for it, so it'd have to be through a vet. Uh, and it's only for pet poultry, not for productive poultry, so you can't eat the eggs from it. And it's basically given to alleviate pain. So this is a show bird. It is a pet. It is not a production animal. Typically, you cannot give those compounds to um, a, a food animal. Ma'am, now you have to remove upper side box. I can't remove it. That upper box is going to stay there. I can't get it to go down. Uh, let's see if I get rid of that. Nope. Can't do it. That's what you're going to get. Sorry. That top box wants to stay there. Let's see if I try that. No, that doesn't work either. Whoops. Okay, I managed to clear it somehow. Uh, where are we? Okay, so uh, that's, as I said, none of those drugs can be used for uh, hens producing eggs for consumption. So if this was a production flock, you would just need to terminate the bird. Sorry. Um, if the infection, if there is an infection present, the treatment usually requires a combination of analgesics to help with the pain, anti-inflammatories, broad, broad spectrum antibiotics. You need to provide aggressive supportive care because they're not going to be doing well. Uh, you need therapies aimed at reducing the egg laying activity. So for some, this is a gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist. So it stops egg production, stops the release of the yolks. Unfortunately, this type of birth control, I guess you'd call it, is not a long-term answer to the problem because uh, it becomes less and less effective as time goes on. Um, but so, you know, if it's a pet animal, you can try that to get it started to see if you can get their health back. But surgery may be needed to re remove any excessive accumulations of egg material. So as I said, it, uh, you may need to, um, to check a laparoscopy, you know, looking at inside, you know, fluids inside, surgical exploration. And so if surgery is required, a sphalingohysterectomy is required. So you have to remove both the ovaries and the oviduct. Um, the ovaries uh, would be the hysterectomy part and the oviduct, which is the sphalingo part. So basically it's a total hysterectomy with ovaries and oviducts removed. Again, this you'd only want to do it for a pet bird because it's not very um, you know, cost effective for a production bird. Uh, if you treat a hen for internal parasites, how long to wait until you consume the eggs? Always somebody asks something has nothing to do with what we're doing. Uh, you have to use an approved uh, dewormer. Uh, if it's not approved, there is no official withdrawal time because it's not approved in the first place. The only uh, one that is approved for egg laying hens for, for food consumption is a safeguard, uh, which is a certain formula for a uh, fenbendazole, but if you use anything that does not say it's approved for egg production, you're not legally allowed to sell the eggs. I would wait a month. Uh, 
Okay, this just shows you uh, some photographs of a um, surgery being done uh, to remove the material. Uh, it's not the removal of the uh, ovaries or, or the oviduct. It's simply removing the, um, the offending material as it called. Uh, so this uh, one-year-old white bantam silky hen uh, had egg-related solomitis and they um, in number one or A rather, uh, the forceps are holding some of the uh, egg material that's present uh, and C shows you um, the three whole soft egg shell shelled eggs, the three egg remnants that were loose within the salemic cavity. None of this was in the oviduct. It was all in the uh, salemic cavity. Okay, the other problem that we see is often referred to as egg bound, egg binding, something like that. The egg gets stuff, it stuck in the oviduct. Uh, it typically occurs uh, when a hen is straining to produce an egg for more than a few hours. Uh, the technical term rather than egg binding is dystocia because it has not been able to lay the egg. And again, because of the swollen um, cavity, uh, it is uh, resulting in the penguin-like uh, stance. So producers have different views on the precise definition of egg bound or egg binding. Dystocia in which an egg becomes trapped in the vagina, which is the ultimate end of the reproductive tract. Um, the egg is visible on examination and you should definitely be able to palpate it to see it. That's one form of being egg bound. And you can often see it on a radiograph. Uh, this one happens to be a female cockatiel with both egg binding and salopingitis, which is inflammation of the oviduct. It's a relatively small egg with irregularly hypercalcified shell that can't be passed. It, there is also a large radiodense soft tissue swelling in the abdomen leading to the, a loss of the um, hourglass shape of the heart, liver. There's compression of the thoracic abdominal sacs as well. So that's going to interfere with uh, breathing. And this one is uh, a patient that was uh, very large, had a very large incompletely mineralized ductal egg. That's the one going sideways. So it's still in the oviduct. Uh, and then smaller fragments of impacted but reabsorbed egg uh, where the small uh, horizontal uh, arrow is. And then there's the encasing of the cloacal dispenser, which, you know, near the end. So it's near the vagina, which is a big sized egg, which is the um, going up. So you can see this, this poor hen has a lot going on uh, in her oviduct. You can also look at ultrasounds. Uh, if you're an expert at reading ultrasounds, this is one that has some egg material uh, stuck in the oviduct. Uh, and this one does as well. You need to be able to read uh, a um, ultrasound to be able to figure out what it is. Okay, so uh, one of the common causes is nutrition. As I said, obesity, number one problem. The other is hypocalcemia, which is sometimes referred to as calcium tetany, although that term is mostly, mostly used for milking cows. Uh, basically, it's hen, hens with a low blood calcium level often because of poor quality or unbalanced diet, or because someone has taken a completely balanced diet and diluted it with scratch grains or cracked corn. 
Um, having mycotoxins in the feed can also cause that problem. Most commercial operations add some sort of mycotoxin binder or um, not a binder or a, something to inactivate it. Um, if you have a calcium deficiency, you have an interaction with all the other minerals and some of the vitamins uh, going on as well. Uh, so you're getting lots of nutritional deficiencies that all started with the calcium problem. Uh, and as I said, calcium is essential for muscle function. Um, if you start egg production prematurely, so you light stimulate the birds to lay eggs before um, they reach the proper target body weight, you can start seeing problems. And that hens that are laying excessively large eggs for a long period of time, that can cause the problem. Uh, and you do get an increased incidence with increased age and any trauma to the body of the bird can also cause uh, the problem. Uh, as well with uh, treatment, it may be able to expel the, expel the egg with adequate lubrication. Uh, you may need to solve the, the low calcium. Um, you can inject um, calcium gluconate which is used to treat hypocalcemia in people as well as animals um, to try and give them that initial boost of blood calcium. And then you follow it up with calcium glubinate and, or calcium carbonate orally to you know, keep it up. Some vets or even backyard owners advocate breaking the egg to remove it. While that will rectify the initial problem, get the egg out of there, it does predispose the bird to developing an inflammation of the oviduct. So it can cause other problems by trying to get the egg out that way. So something to think about before you try it. Uh, this is um, showing you uh, surgery again uh, for a blocked, uh, egg in the oviduct. Uh, so it's a series of photographs. A is, you know, the patient before surgery. B is when it's ready for surgery. C is when they've opened it up and you can see a normal egg uh, or a yolk there. Um, D, you're starting to get some of the fragments of bound eggs. And then uh, E is the re three recovered eggs with an egg frag fragment, a normal egg, and an oversized soft-shelled egg. Um, and then F and G are closing it up um, and preparing it uh, for the bird to keep going. And H is you know, after the surgery and the bird has recovered, uh, she has started laying again uh, as evidenced by the egg uh, underneath her. So surgery can help. Um, but again, you may be using drugs that are not suitable for food animals. So you wouldn't want to do this on a production flock. But if it's a pet bird that you want to keep, um, make sure that you check with the veterinarian all the drugs that they use to see whether or not uh, you can eat the eggs when she has started laying again. Um, if the flock has a high percentage of double yoked eggs, it's important to review the lighting program. Uh, you may be able to reduce egg production or reduce the size of the eggs, but most of that is controlled by the feeding program. So you might wanna change the nutrition of the hens, especially if they're overweight or the egg is higher than it recommended for that breed and age to try and prevent it from happening again. Salopingitis is an inflammation of the oviduct. And this is usually because infections have worked their way up from the vent and cloaca and have settled in the oviduct resulting in an infection. This increases with older hens, especially those producing large eggs for a long time. 
The most common bacteria seen is E. coli, uh, although some opportunistic bacteria and even a couple of viruses can also be involved. Oviduct impaction uh, occurs sporadically when the oviduct is blocked by the accumulation of eggs or masses of yolk and coagulated albumin. Uh, usually follows an incidence of chronic salivaginitis, um, salopingitis, sorry. Uh, Yolk-like materials in the oviduct may appear as concentric rings with the odor of a cooked egg. Such eggs may be enclosed by shell membranes and may be found in the abdominal cavity as well as in the oviduct. So this shows you advanced chronic salopingitis with marked dilation of the magnum. So this is in the magnum uh, and you can see the concentric rings in the material and they say it smells like cooked eggs. This is the same thing, uh, chronic salopingoperitonitis. So this, they're saying, you know, that would indicate in the cavity, but um, mostly they're showing you the magnum, uh, which is swelling with all that exudate in it. Uh, and the surface of the magnum has stuff on it. So that's where it's in the body cavity. Um, and again, you can see the pale cream colored caseous exudate, which means it's cheese-like, uh, causing problems in the, the magnum. Prolapse is something we're seeing more and more from improper nutrition mainly. When an egg is laid, the vagina everts through the cloaca to deliver the egg, and then it is typically retracted back into the body cavity. If there has been an injury to the vagina, such as from a large or double yoked egg, or if the hen is overly fat, the vagina may not retract immediately, leaving it exposed for a short period of time. If there is a lot of light in the, the area, the other birds are gonna see it, they can peck at it and uh, really damage it so that it definitely can't go back in um, and can cause them to actually peck out so they eat uh, all of the oviduct. So when the protruding organ is pecked at by other hens, the complete oviduct and parts of the adjacent intestinal tract because they're connected at the cloaca may be pulled out. They call that a peck out. So you get a dead bird, you open it up, it has no organs in it. Um, bleeding from the vent can also uh, be a result of pecking. Alternatively, the vagina swells, cannot retract, and remains prolapsed. And they call that a blowout. You can get it with any species. Um, chickens do not have a penis, so you don't normally get that with males. Uh, waterfowl, such as ducks, do have a penis, and so you can get prolapse with male ducks, um, and I have seen that. Uh, my nephew had a problem with his breeding ducks, uh, trying to get the, the penis to go back inside. So some of the common causes, the age of the hens, prolapse occurs most often at peak egg production when there's a large demand on the hen's metabolism. Um, if there is high light intensity, the hen, other hens in the flock are more likely to see and start pecking on it, causing damage so that it cannot go back in. Underweight birds at light stimulation can cause it. Overweight birds can do it. Um, they have a tendency to larger eggs, including laying double yoked eggs. Too much fat around the reproductive organs can cause muscle weakness. Unbalanced feed rations can result in insufficient calcium in the diet, which will adversely affect the muscle tone. So that's where the muscles involved in the egg laying and retraction of the oviduct don't function properly. And as I said before, genetics can play a line, especially can play a factor, including uh, genetics. So the commercial genet turkeys that we know that have been selected for rapid growth and high 
meat yield have an increased incidence of prolapse of the oviduct compared to unselected or traditional heritage strains of chickens. So that can always be a problem with the commercial turkeys. It's not usually a problem with um, you know, the, the heritage type breeds or ones that are not as heavily selected as the genetic lines of commercial turkeys. There, um, there are different types of treatments. You know, once it's really bad, it can be really hard to do it. Um, there were two papers that looked at herbal care for it. Um, basically, the protruding organ is washed in lukewarm water and using a natural oil such as linseed oil or sweet oil, then you gently press the vent back into the body and you ne may need to repeat several times if it won't stay back inside. Wipe the vent area with a cloth or cotton ball that has been soaked in witch hazel. Uh, witch hazel is an astringent and anti-inflammatory that tightens skin, smooths and reduces swelling. Uh, it is used among other things to relieve pain of hemorrhoids and bruises. So you're basically using it off label. If you don't want to use the Hubel Care, you can push the organ back in or wash the organ in lukewarm, lukewarm water and use petroleum, petroleum jelly to gently push the vent back into the body. Again, you may have to repeat it to keep it inside and then treat the vent area with a combination of preparation H, which uh, is used for treating hemorrhoids and an antibiotic ointment so that you're not getting an infection into the um, oviduct. The preparation H reduces the swelling of the tissue and allows the tissue to get back into the body cavity. And um, the, you may have to restore the uh, hormone levels to normal in order to get them to fully recover from the prolapse, which would of course require a veterinarian. Uh, in the event of a severe prolapse, if you truly do not wish to call the bird, a temporary purse suture, which is a surgical suture passed as a running stitch in and out along the edge of a circular wound in such a way that when the ends of the suture are drawn tight, the wound is closed like a purse. So you do this to the cloaca to try and get you know, the stuff to stay inside. You will have to remove it later or you know, things won't come out, including poop. Uh, another uh, problem that you can see sometimes is uh, chronic ophritis, which is inflammation of the ovary. Uh, we don't normally see a lot of it, but it can happen if the infection works its way up to the ovary. Again, an antibiotic would be required. Uh, a lot of the things I said were that, you know, egg size can have a play a role. And so how can you affect egg size? Um, breed. What do I got here? Uh, some breeds are known to produce small eggs due to their small body size and genetic makeup, but some breeds produce medium to large eggs. So some of the egg size is based on the genetics of the bird. Ambient temperature in hot temperatures, hens usually lay smaller eggs often because feed intake is lower uh, in the hotter uh, temperatures. The higher ambient temperature, the lower egg production and the smaller the egg size. Lighting programs during the growing period can play a role. So uh, lighting programs can be used to delay or accelerate sexual maturity. Hens come into egg production with increased in daylight, so we call that light stimulation. Uh, the age at which pullets begin to lay eggs, which, you know, to be light stimulated to lay eggs has a significant impact on the subsequent egg size. Uh, the younger the hen, 
when they start laying, the smaller the eggs produced in the first year. Uh, an overly large uh, hen will lay larger eggs for most of her life. The age of the hen, as I said, younger hens lay smaller eggs. As they grow older, the egg size usually increases. Uh, hens at 20 to 26 weeks of age will lay smaller eggs than hens at 40 to 50 weeks of age. And you saw that graph, the typical egg production graph where even once they start laying eggs, they are still increasing uh, in egg size. Uh, the maximum egg size is expected when hens are about one year old. Feed intake provided that all required nutrients are available at the correct level in the feed. The higher the feed intake, the larger the eggs. Water consumption also contributes to the size of an egg. When water availability is low, it affects egg size as well as egg production. I am not recommending water restriction to try and affect egg size because that can also affect the health of the birds in other ways. Chickens will not eat if they can't drink, so a lot of the water consumption is also affecting feed consumption, which affects production and egg size. Nutrition, the loss or unavailability of one or more nutrients will affect egg production rate and egg size. Uh, egg size responds to methionine and linoleic acid levels. So uh, you can adjust those in the diet uh, as long as they are adequate for egg production, you can increase or decrease the, the levels. Diseases are stressors to chickens and they can affect intake to a varying degree, which affects egg production, which also increases, uh, also affects egg size. Uh, okay, some other problems that you might see with um, uh, reproductive disorders would be uh, an infectious bronchitis infection. So while uh, infectious bronchitis is considered a respiratory problem, it will also affect the, uh, the renal and reproductive systems. It is a coronavirus, but it is not the coronavirus that causes COVID in humans. When we first had the COVID outbreak, um, people panicked and thought they had to kill their chickens so that they didn't get COVID. It's a totally different coronavirus. You cannot get COVID from chickens, okay? But it can affect the reproductive tract of uh, chickens. So often uh, you will see malformed eggs, um, drop in egg production. You'll get the cough and sneezing, which is typical of bronchitis, but you'll also get the uh, deformed eggs. Uh, you can vaccinate. Um, broilers can be vaccinated, although because they have such a short life cycle, life you know, uh, lifespan, because they're usually harvested at six or eight weeks, they don't normally vaccinate, but they could if it's a bad problem in the area. But layers and breeders uh, are typically vaccinated at 14 days of age by water or spray, then they have to give boosters every eight to 12 weeks. We know that with our coronavirus that we get, we have to revaccinate because they can um, mutate and change. Uh, reproductive tract damage can occur if the layers and breeders are vaccinated before 14 days of age. So it's not something that can be done at the hatchery broilers because they do not become uh, reproductive, can be vaccinated at the hatchery. Uh, sometimes you can open a bird that's died of something else and you will see a cystic persistent right oviduct. Um, birds, most birds, uh, all domestic birds, have only one ovary, the left one, only one oviduct, the left one. The right one usually becomes rudimentary. It gets uh, small in size and you usually don't see it at all. But in some birds, uh, it remains and gets cystic. And so you can see 
It has nothing to do with the health and is rarely the cause of the uh, death of the birds as long as it's you know small. There are cases where the cystic right oviduct uh, gets extremely large uh, and has to be removed. So uh, you can see this hen here has the uh, a extremely large cyst that had to be removed. Again, it's probably something you would only do with a uh, pet bird. Uh, tumors are quite common in birds. Lymphoid leukosis affects only chickens, so it doesn't affect the other domestic poultry species. It's associated with neuroplastic masses in a variety of tissues, including the reproductive tract. There is no treatment, there is no vaccine, and it is egg transmitted. It just has a very long incubation period so that it usually does not become um, affect, you know, infective and, and show problems until they are uh, older. So it's not Merrick's disease. Merrick's disease also causes tumors. Uh, Merrick's disease is usually, it has a much shorter uh, lifespan, uh, incubation period, sorry, and it affects mainly young birds. So um, there's nothing they can do for a bird with lymphoid leukosis. The only thing to do is to call breeders that have uh, lymphoid leukosis because it is egg transmitted. That means it goes from mother to hen through the egg. It just takes a year to become visible. The photograph on the right shows the, um, a turkey with ovarian carcinoma. Again, tumors happen. Um, and this is a, a, a nasty one and not much we can do about it. Chickens also have medullary bone. It's a spongy tubicular bone shown there. Serves as a source of calcium to the hen. It's sort of a calcium bank. Chickens cannot eat all the calcium that they require for uh, egg production. So they uh, use the reserves in the medullary bone, pull it out, put it back, pull it out, put it back. If they are laying a lot for a long period of time, whoops, sorry, they um, can deplete that, the bones become weak, the, the birds can't stand up, uh, partly because of the calcium deficiency, but also because of the weak bones causing pain. And that's where you get cage layer fatigue. Um, best thing to do is put the birds through a molt. Uh, when they molt, all the, um, the reproductive organs go back to pullet size and they replenish the medullary bone uh, in the, or the, you know, the material in the medullary bone. Sometimes you will see blood in the eggs. I get a lot of people who think that means that it's fertile egg. No, you're just getting blood in the egg. Uh, on one of the ask extension questions, a woman was concerned that she had a rooster somewhere in her hens because she was finding these blood spots uh, in the eggs. Uh, what happens is a picture on the right shows you the, uh, thing moves on its own, uh, shows you the ovary. You can see that the follicles are highly vascularized to bring in the precursors for the yolk material that gets deposited there. But there is a line where there is no blood vessels that's referred to as the stigma. And the stigma is where it ovulates. Uh, if a blood vessel goes across that and breaks during ovulation, you may get a little bit of blood. If um, you have a vitamin K deficiency, you get a lot of blood. Um, typically, you don't see them in, in eggs in the store because they candle those out. Um, unfortunately, brown egg layers are more genetically susceptible to blood spots, and it's harder to spot blood spots in brown shelled eggs. The darker they are, the harder to see. Sometimes you get uh, double yolked eggs. They usually happen uh, early when they're young birds and they're just starting to get their hormones regulated for egg production. And sometimes at the end when the birds' uh, hormones are starting to break down and they start laying uh, double yolked eggs, you can get a lot of 
double yolked eggs for a long period of time, causing some of the disorders we talked about. This is what an egg should look like. Sometimes you get slab-sided eggs, two eggs in, in the shell gland at the same time, usually a non-calcified egg pressed against the, a calcified egg causing uh, that slab. You can sometimes see wrinkled eggs, especially if your flock has infectious bronchitis, the egg fails to plump up, shell membranes are not fully stretched, wrinkles in the shell membranes become calcified in the shell gland. Often you will also see it if it's an infectious bronchitis case, then you may get, because it's got a lot of fluid in it, if you break that open, it really looks horrible. A body check is a weakened part of the shell. Uh, the egg is cracked while it's in the shell gland and the hand repairs the shell before it lays the egg. That's referred to as oviposition. This is usually caused by some disturbance of the hen. Uh, and so uh, it's a weaker egg. Those are usually called and you don't normally see those in the store, but you, you could see them if you have a home flock. Uh, and then the other question I get a lot of is why have my hens stopped laying eggs? Hens are very sensitive to the amount of light per day, as I said. Um, to maintain year-round egg production, you must maintain a minimum of 14 hours of light per day. You can sometimes increase light later in production to increase production in the later stages, but you should never go over 16 hours per day. But to keep hens laying in production throughout the winter when days are getting shorter, you need to have uh, artificial light. You can use timers. You can use light bulbs that only come on dusk to dawn so that uh, you're, the lamp's not on 24 seven. Always remember to wash your hands after handling live poultry and eggs so that you do not get sick. Uh, salmonellosis is always a problem in uh, during chick time. People handle the baby chicks, they get salmonellosis and, and get really sick. Some have been hospitalized, some have died. So we have a campaign going on to make sure every time you handle birds, handle their equipment, handle their eggs, you wash your hands with soap and water. Uh, resources available to you. Um, as I said, e-extension is the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service specifically for, um, oh, I, should, I shouldn't have turned it off because I didn't share the links. Okay. Um, they are for uh, small and backyard flocks. So uh, we have our website here. This was what I was going to do, was to try and put it in the chat box. Um, so that is our website. Uh, this is our Facebook page. It has, uh, it's where I announce upcoming uh, webinars. Um, the other page has also links to it. Um, it has articles. It has a blog. Uh, it also has ask extension, um, but you often get a faster answer if you ask me. So I put those in there so you should be able to see them. Uh, questions. Okay, yes, there are boxes blocking your screen. Okay, I got rid of those, I hope, uh, and I answered that one. So are there any questions? Um, we're a little over time. Let me can verify that my agents are here. So Shad's there, Brittany. Whoops, Miranda. Miranda, you're not listed, but I'll find out why. Let me stop. 
Oh, okay, I gotta check, see if there's any questions. If you treat a hand for, oh, for, you know, okay, you did that one already. Were there any other questions? Oh, there's Miranda right there. And then Meredith. Gary. Brittany Brewer, Kristen Fisto, and Regina Utz, are you there? Fisto, Brittany Brewer. Okay, are there any questions before I shut you down? This was recorded. The uh, message, the recording will be up uh, shortly. Okay, any other questions? Pam, were you wanting continuing education credits? I, I can only give them to um, Kentucky agents, but I could send you something that you could use, I guess. Any other questions? Desmond, I don't see you on here, but you might have registered late. Okay, I'll try and send you something, Pam. Uh, Ma'am, this problem mainly found infertility or infertility and difference between germ spot and blood spot. Blood spot is from the breakage in a blood vessel when the uh, yolk is released from the follicle it has nothing to do with fertility or infertility. It can happen in any uh, bird laying eggs. Uh, they don't have to be fertile to be laying eggs. Uh, hens do not need a rooster to lay eggs. The germ spot is the uh, female genetic material on the surface of the egg. It's where fertil uh, fertilization would have occurred if it happened in the infundibulum of the reproductive tract. Um, this, these problems are with egg laying, so it doesn't matter if there's a rooster there or not. It happens with egg production flocks, breeder flocks, uh, anything like that. Um, it, uh, the other reproductive problem is that male infertility can occur. There is a test for that. Um, is there an issue with leaving heat lambs on overnight during Production, yes. Um, during the rearing period, it's all right, as, as long as you take them out uh, after they no longer need heating lamps. Uh, red heating lamps are better than white heating lamps. Um, I, Pam, I think you're in my, um, you're in my context because you're a part of the, the group. Anybody else? Any questions? Can double yolked eggs produce a chicken or not? Typically, no. Uh, they will develop embryos. Typically, they die before they can hatch because they uh, need to be in the correct spot in order to break out of an egg. I have seen people put videos on YouTube where they have manually taken them out and uh, gotten twins. But um, typically, uh, if left to their own devices, they are not able to hatch. Often there's not enough room. So again, it, they uh, may or may not um, be able to develop fully. 
Uh, okay, any other questions? How many duration egg laying process and how many time spent in parts of reproductive tract? Uh, we have a, we have a um, fact sheet on that. We have it on the, um, the, the main website of ours that will go through all that. It usually takes 24 to 26 hours for an egg to be, go from ovulation to uh, ova position, which is the laying. The longest period is in the uh, shell gland. Um, hardly any time in the vagina. The, um, the infundibulum is only 15 minutes, so it has 15 minutes to fertilize before it goes on. I don't remember the exact time, but they are listed uh, on our website uh, in fact sheets and things like that. They also ovulate 30 minutes after the last, uh, after they lay the eggs, typically for the high product producing types. Any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So thank you all for coming. We have gone over time. Um, next month's uh, webinar is, let me, I should have checked before I came on. Uh, next month's webinar is raising turkeys in small and backyard flocks. Dr. Sally Knoll, who uh, does mainly turkey research, um, but is familiar with small and backyard flocks, will be doing that March 7th at 3 p.m. Registration is already uh, posted uh, on the website. So. Uh, hope to see you then. Thank you very much for coming and uh, hope to see you uh, next time uh, or next month for the next one. Everybody have a good day. That is the end of the, um, the workshop. What am I doing? Okay, thank you very much.